Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. And we have got a fun show today. We have something here from Ben. He writes in and says, he watched an old video I did on prairie grouse hunting in Nebraska. That's on my Ron Spomer Outdoors channel. And he has a question. He says, hey, Ron, is it possible to have much success on these kinds of hunts without a dog? And our special guest today is here to answer that question. Covey, the English setter. Covey, can you have much success hunting prairie grouse? Those would be sharp tails and prairie chickens without a dog. Oh, uh, no chance, man. You gotta have a dog. If you go hunting birds without a dog, it's a crime. People should be arrested for such nonsense. Take me along. <laughs> now, now, seriously, folks, Covey does believe that. Trust me. But I have hunted without a dog for prairie grouse, and it is possible. It's just not nearly as successful or as much fun. Right, Covey? Right. <laughs> no, a, a dog really helps in big open country like that because these are native grasslands. And until you've hunted them a lot and really get to understand how these birds, these are native grouse, how they interact with those grasslands. It can be darn tough to find them when you have a big running pointing dog like good old, good old, uh, well, I was to think that she's not in that video. The dog there was Cheyenne, my previous English setter, a big running dog like Cheyenne or Covey here. Uh, then they're out there covering, oh my gosh, they probably cover 10 times more country than you could. So while you're walking on one side of the ridge, they could be across the valley couple of hundred yards away, 300, 400 even, sniffing and looking and finding birds for you. And then they point and say, come on, man, over here. <laughs> and you get a lot more action. And of course, they're valuable for making the retrieve. So as a pure hunter, if you just want to get out to that beautiful grassland country of Nebraska or South Dakota, parts of Kansas, any of those great plains grasslands in which your native grouses are sharp-tailed grouse, Lesser prairie chickens, greater prairie chickens. You can do it without a dog. And it's just great fun to wander those big open grasslands and hunt, even if you don't find that many birds. But you certainly can stumble into them, especially if you look a lot, use a binocular and watch. Usually in the mornings, these birds will fly from their roosting cover to their feeding cover. So if you're up at the crack of dawn, and you just watch the countryside and glass the hillsides and whatnot, you can often find these birds flying to their feeding grounds. And the later it gets in the fall, the more they'll go toward grain fields. So if there's a wheat field, barley field, sunflowers, anything like that out there, you'll watch them fly into those fields and then back out to the hills to roost again, and you get to know where they're hanging out, and that helps. But boy, you're going to have a lot more fun if you take along a good, fine-haired friend like Covey. Now, for those of you who are listening to the podcast and can't see Covey, I suggest you check out Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast on YouTube, and then you can see this gorgeous dog. She is an absolute beauty. Oh, man. Covey, you don't know that I'm bragging on you, do you? No, I just want to go hunting. <laughs> She's a great dog, hunting or not. Yeah, I know. More pets, more pets. She loves attention. All right, that was a good question, Ben. I really appreciate it. And I hope you get out into our big, vast open grasslands and get to hunt some of those birds. They are some of my absolute favorites. You know, it's not just the bird that you're hunting. It's the country in which you're hunting them. And parts of the Nebraska Sandhills where I have hunted are literally, well, figuratively at least, wilderness. There are ranches out there, and people have been there for a long, long time, but they have not been developed. You don't see a lot of power lines, very few highways. It's just mile after mile of country that looks the same as it did 200, 400 years ago. Grasslands, native grasses and forbs and a few shrubs here and there, and just glorious feeling that you get when you're out there of this incredible openness, comparable to being up in the tundra of Alaska, really. So I urge anyone and everyone to get out there. Now, there are public lands on which you can go. Valentine, Nebraska is a good, good place to get down to the Valentine Wildlife Refuge with lots of big open ground. Up in South Dakota, in the middle of the state, there are the Fort Pier National Grasslands. There's the Cheyenne uh, River. There's some grasslands up in there. Uh, various parts of South Dakota has big grasslands, Buffalo Gap National Grasslands. Free to go hunting out there. 
camping, roaming. It's just wonderful. So check it out. Okay. Now, uh, I want to recommend a book quickly. A lot of you folks like to hear about the books I'm reading. I hope this one's not glaring too much. It's Real Hunting and Campfire Humor by one of my favorites, Jack Atchison Sr. This gentleman is one funny writer, and he has had some wild adventures. I think I've mentioned his book before on some of my uh, podcasts and or my regular channel, but I just keep coming back to it because his stories are so genuine and so revealing of the era. He started in roughly 1948 with Jack Atchison and Sons Booking Agency in Butte, Montana. So he had a chance to hunt with a lot of outfitters and guides in the early years, rolling right into the 21st century. He passed away a few years ago, and he was quite the raconteur. If you had dinner with him, you just sat back and enjoyed the stories and tried to keep your food in your mouth because you were laughing so hard. He is just really something. If you want to read some fine, fine hunting stories with a lot of crazy adventures, like putting an elk on top of your new Ford car and having it crush the car in, Jack Atchison is the one to get, so check it out. Real Hunting and Campfire Humor by Jack Atchison Sr. Now, questions for me from our patrons on Patreon. Gimpy is one of our patrons, and he's asking me something about safaris in the United States. What is your opinion of an in-country safari for people who are unable or unwilling to travel outside the United States for a hunt? At some of these ranches in Texas, you can hunt and bring home the meat of anything from Cape Buffalo to exotic species of deer with a price from relatively cheap to upwards of $100 a pound of the animal, depending on the variety and the size of the rack and such. So what do I think about that? Well, Gimpy, well, let me just read to you what I, what I wrote to Gimpy, because I answer our patrons right away. Hunting, hunting exotics in Texas can feel like a wild hunt or a fenced-in joke. It depends on the acreage, how heavily it is grazed or browsed, and how wild or wary the game is. Honestly, I've been in, the, in some sensibly managed wild places in Africa where game was so little disturbed that it acted as if it was half tame. They uh, only shoot old males and only about 2% of the herd each year in Africa on some of these hunting blocks. So most of the animals get used to seeing trucks cruising the area and people walking around without really bothering them. So uh, similar things will happen on a Tex Texas exotic ranch, but often they are getting more pressure there. So they're spookier, wilder, and harder to get up on on these ranches. So some Texas game has been harder for me to get up to than some of the African game. So you need to consider that in addition to this wonderful feeling we get when we're hunting in a wild area. To me, that's really important. I don't care so much that the herd of buffalo or kudu or whatever I come across is super spooky or not, so much as having the feeling that I'm the first person to be there, at least in recent time, if not ever. I just love it when I get out into the wilds and I think to myself, my goodness, this is so far back in there. I'll bet you no one has been here for 400 years. That's the ultimate for me. But truly, uh, you can find some, some of these big fenced ranch places in which the game is spookier and harder to approach than in some pristine wild areas. <laughs> There's such a thing as pristine anymore. So you might want to check it out. Um, it really does vary depending on the ranch and how it's managed. He adds something here after I responded to him, and he said, Hey, Rick, bad news. My Patreon renewal came up, and with inflation being what it is, I asked my wife if I should renew or not, and she said, No way. If I have to put up with your hunting disorder, so does Ron. <laughs> so I guess you're stuck with me for another year. Oh, thanks, Gimpy, and thank your wife for me. I am more than happy to share your hunting disorder with you. <laughs> Here's another patron. This is Josh. Josh asked, howdy, Ron. I'm wondering how much you adjust your parallax on your scope for different distances in the hunting field. Do you just set, set it for maximum? What if you're lucky enough to get closer? So here's what I responded to uh, Josh. I hey, Josh. Parallax matters only if you routinely or often Position your eye well off axis with the scope reticle, and your target is beyond about 300 yards and tiny. In other words, for 98% of your hunting, it's really not a concern. Most deer and big game hunting scopes are set parallax free, which means they're perfectly focused 
at 100 to 150 yards. This is adequate for the average hunter for delivering bullets within an inch or two of point of aim, regardless of how off-center your eye is behind the scope. I have noticed over the decades that if my bullet strikes two or three inches left, right, high, or low from my center of chest hold on a deer-sized animal or elk, pronghorn, deer, etc., it expires all the same because I'm in the vital zone. So the only time I worry about tweaking my parallax is when I'm addressing small targets or whether they're animated targets or, or hunting targets, animals, or they're beyond 300 yards. Beyond 300 yards, it really starts to add up. Otherwise, I just hunt. So if that made sense or not, I don't know, but let's go back to what parallax is. The parallax is essentially looking at uh, an object Two objects, really, the crosshair of your scope, the reticle, and then the target. And if the target from your scope isn't focused precisely on that reticle, you've got a gap between them. And then if you have a gap between things, your position in relation to them changes how they relate to one another. So think of it, I always, I always talk about an old speedometer on cars back in the 60s and 70s before they become digital, where you had the numbers on a screen and then this little lever that, that indicated where you were, what your speed was. And as so you've got this half circle with 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, 30, 40, 50, 60 on down to 120 because we used to go really fast in the 60s. <laughs> and then you got your needle coming up as you step on the gas. Well, if you're directly behind that little screen of numbers and your needle comes up, and if it shows you're at 60 miles an hour, you're looking at it, you're at 60 miles an hour. But your partner over here in the rider's seat is looking at it from a different angle. And there's a gap between that needle and the screen of numbers behind it. So Covey here would look at it and say, dude, you're only doing about 40. Let's pick up the speed here. We got birds to find. <laughs> that is a parallax problem. So now think of it with a scope. You're behind the scope, perfectly aligned with the reticle, and your target is not exactly on the same plane of focus as that reticle. If you move your head left or right, you're going to be off target. And you can do this with your fingers. Just hold one out at arm's length and the other one just a couple of inches from your face and line them up and then move your head to the side or close your eye and you really see the parallax jump. If I look at my front finger right now and line it up with my closest finger to my eye, I close my left eye, the right eye's got them lined up. I close the right eye, open my left eye, and holy mackerel, I have jumped way over to the side from that alignment. Parallax. But if they're both come together like this, where my fingers are touching, I can look at them from any position, and they're still lined up because they're both in the same plane. That's parallax in a scope. So. If you adjust your parallax in your scope, what you're doing is you're focusing it. You're focusing the target onto the reticle inside of the scope. Then you don't have any parallax. But as I said here to Josh, it's really not a problem for big game hunting if you are reasonably centered in your scope and it's not too far away. Your target's not too far away. Yeah, but boy, if you're precision shooting at distance, you do want to pay attention to that stuff. Parallax can make a difference. Right, Covey? You ever have a parallax issues when you're pointing birds? Do you ever get the scent coming from the left when it's really the right? Yeah, I've seen that a few times. You're pointing over here and the bird gets up over there. What is with that anyway? <laughs> yeah, don't you go begging for permission to touch this computer. I don't trust you to type straight. Now, let me see if we've got some questions on here. Covey, you want to jump down and go, uh, go outside now? Okay, you can get down. Good girl. Go down. Atta girl. We'll see you later. We'll, I'll go out and take you for a walk here, okay? You go be a good girl. All right, now we have some new questions, and this is from Eduardo in Texas. Hey, Mr. Spomer, I was looking to buy a 22-250 Remington, and I found one in the Weatherby Vanguard series with a 1 and 14 inch twist. And I also found some rifles with faster twist. What are your thoughts? Uh, on And what about that AI? Is that out of the question? For now, I don't do any reloading. Yes, Eduardo, if you don't hand load, you're not going to find 22-250 Ackley improved. That's the 22-250 blown out a little bit to straighten the sidewalls with a 40-degree shoulder. So you can shoot standard 22-250s in a 22-250 Ackley improved chamber. The brass will just form to the slightly larger size. 
um, but you're going to get probably a little bit lower velocity because you've got that extra space in the chamber for the pressure to move into. But then once you've fired one time, you've got your new brass and you could load it. If you don't hand load, there's no advantage. So don't get an AI. Uh, just get your standard 22 250. There's only about 100 feet per second, maybe 150 feet per second velocity difference between the two. Not really significant, but the AI cases are better for reloading. They're easier to reload. They have longer case life. They don't stretch as much between loadings and stuff. So that's what I would recommend there. As far as the twist rate, you say you found some with a faster twist, and it sounds like those might be in the AI chambering. So yeah, what they're doing there is what I did with my 22250 AI. I got a one in eight twist barrel so I can shoot heavier bullets, longer bullets. It's the length that needs extra spin to stabilize. So one in eight twist will stabilize a 75, 80 grain bullet, maybe even a little longer than that. So if you want to shoot those longer, heavier bullets, you're going to have to get a faster twist than one in 14. One in 14 twist, you're lucky to stabilize even a fairly stodgy 60 grain bullet, probably 55. I had some one in 14 twist 22 250s over the years, and I couldn't stabilize 60 grain flat base bullets from nozzle. I had to stick with 55s as my longest bullet. So that's what you're up against there. Okay, from Central Washington is Perry. Ron, uh, right away, I enjoy your articles and videos. Thank you, Perry. They're informative and humble. I'm humble. Well, I have to be. <laughs> you see what you look out here. <laughs> I recently decided to buy another hunting rifle using your articles and videos to decide on a 270. I actually bought three 270s. Whoa, one for myself and one for each son. Oh, that is nice. Tika. T3X Light Veil Wildlands. Woo! One Alpine for graduation gifts in June. Lucky guys. Congratulations on your graduation and enjoy those rifles. Now, the 300 Winchester Magnum in a Browning Automatic, the auto loading Browning rifle. I have it. Is it too big to start them off on? We're arch archery hunters for deer and elk, but not from blinds or stands either. Is there time for them to familiarize themselves with this rifle? Thanks again for your information uh, to help me in this decision. Oh, boy. Yeah, uh, let's see. I guess they're graduating from high school, right? So I don't know how big and husky they are, but it really doesn't matter. Um, once you've got your, your muscles and your form and all, you can be a 100-pounder and handle a 300 wind mag. But it does pay to work your way up. I wouldn't start them off with it. 270 would be a lot easier. Going to have a lot less recoil there. And it's usually not the recoil that bothers new shooters not used to it. It's the noise. There's really not that much recoil in a 270 or even a 30 out 6. Starts to bite a little bit when you go, say, 30 out 6 with a 180 grain bullet or higher. But the 300 wind mag, of course, boy, you're shooting another 300 feet per second into that bullet. So there's more recoil there. So I would start them off with that 270. And if you can borrow a 243 or a 223 just to get them going, if they've never shot center fire rifles before, that would be smart too. In fact, you may go all the way down to a 22 rim fire if they have not been rifle shooters. That is a great way to train proper shooting technique. And by that, we mean mostly trigger control, holding that rifle steadily and easing that trigger back to make that gun go bang without recoil or noise. And they can really learn to be precise that way. Then you work your way up in power to a 223, 243, 270. And usually by then, folks are pretty well trained and can handle recoil. That's what I would do. And the 270 with the right bullet is more than adequate for elk or even moose. I have no issue trying it on either one. In fact, I have, so I know they work. Now, it looks like you've got some more questions here. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. Another subject. Powder burners, down and air rifles. Uh, are you going to share something about air rifles? Hmm. Most people don't know that our military trains sharpshooters with air rifles. I didn't know that. I had a fine work bow, fine work bow. Sounds like a German air gun. A 300S marked USMC, United States Marine Corps. Hmm. Must be. We have many powder burners, but some very nice air rifles huh okay so he's talking about these 
German air rifles. Okay. Wow. They got them out of Sweden, Czech Republic, lots of them, huh? My wife's a city girl, Seattle. Uh, full music academic scholarship, fourth grade school teacher. Can't get enough of shooting ground squirrels with her. <laughs> Let me darn. Lewis and Clark had a very nice air rifle on their exploration. That's true. Um, okay, so this guy is just all about air guns. Hmm. Anyway, a lot of good stuff with air rifles, and many firearm owners use them for practice and shooting at home. That's, yeah, good point. Uh-huh. So I'm happy to talk air rifles, firearms, and classic cars anytime. Just call me. He gives his phone number. I won't give it out, Perry. Yeah, you got me thinking. I probably do need to dig into air rifles. I've got a buddy, Tom Claycomb, that does air rifle stuff all the time, and he's always trying to get me to get involved with his air rifles. And I tell him, Tom, I've, I'm up to here with regular rifles. <laughs> I just don't have time for air rifles. But I've noticed a lot more interest in air rifles and a lot more development in them. Guys are hunting big game. They say they're up to 70, maybe even 0.75 calibers. That's like shooting a 12-gauge air gun. <laughs> Um, it's, and I can understand why, because in so many countries, firearms are so restricted and even a lot of jurisdictions in this country, it's just getting more and more difficult. And really the only difference between an air rifle and a firearm, a powder driven rifle is the source of the pressure. It's just pressure pushing the bullets out of the barrel. The pressure can be delivered by turning a solid, a gunpowder, smokeless gunpowder solid, you burn it and then it immediately converts it into a gas in microseconds. And the volume required to make that conversion is huge. And that, of course, is what raises the pressure inside of that tight steel chamber. And the only way to exit is to blow the bolt out the back, which you don't want, or the bullet out the front, which you do. And that's what does it, the pressure of the powder turning into a gas. Well, air guns use a gas, air, <laughs> oxygen, nitrogen, and all the rest of them that are in the atmosphere. You pump it up, and it's that mechanical pressure of increasing the pressure inside of a chamber gets the pressure to the point that it is capable of driving a bullet out of the barrel. And uh, you're not usually able to get the pressures up in an air gun to what you get with a firearm. But if you use a big enough bullet, the momentum of that bullet and its mass takes over and does the damage and takes the animal. So guys are now taking Cape Buffalo with air guns. So it's worth looking into. What I particularly don't like about them is all the apparatus needed to pumping them up. You either need one heck of a bicycle pump and a lot of sweat, or you pre-charge it. And that's what most of them are these days. It's like going to get your scuba tank filled up before you go diving go to the shop and they've got this pressure tank thing and they drive that pressure into the reservoir in usually the stock or under the barrel on your air gun. And then it's good for, oh, I don't know, three to 12 shots or something, uh, depending on how much pressure you're letting out to drive that bullet at whatever velocity. So as long as you've got this pump and you can buy them to plug in, I think even to the cigarette lighter of your vehicle, you can pump that gun up. And most of us, if we're big game hunting, you don't need 12 shots or even five shots. You do it right, you need one shot. And if you've got an air gun that will give you three good, solid, high-pressure shots in a row, you ought to be able to go deer hunting. So, yeah, good point there. We might have to get into air guns someday, but I'm resisting the urge. I'm just going to stick with firearms here while I can. All right, from uh, upstate New York, we hear from Zeba. I'm curious about the 500 Smith & Wesson. Ooh, going for the big guys right off, aren't you? This cartridge seems plenty powerful, but clearly lacks capability at range. However, when shot from a rifle, not a handgun, the round gains huge velocity and energy. How far is effective range from a rifle, and what game could it be used for? Boy, knowing what I know about the 500 Smith & Wesson handgun cartridge, it's more than capable of taking pretty much any game in North America. It's just a matter, as you said, of distance. You're going to be shooting a blunt flat bullet because this is made for a revolver so you've got a flat nosed bullet and that costs you because you're just pushing air out of the way and using all your energy to push that air the drag on the bullet slows it down quickly so i would guess you're probably good to 200 yards with the rifle maybe 250 gonna have a fairly arcing trajectory but that bullet mass is significant enough 
that I think you'll have the momentum in it to probably do pretty well. But don't just take my word for this because I have not hunted with a 500. I've shot a couple wheel guns in it. I preferred the 460 Smith & Wesson, a little bit narrower bullet, but a little more higher velocity and a higher sectional density on those same bullets because they're narrower. And I chose that as, I think, my ultimate for the biggest handgun revolver cartridge for hunting. I wouldn't hesitate to shoot deer with a handgun, a wheel gun, in that or the Smith probably to 150 yards. But I would want to look at ballistic trajectory tables and really study them to get a good firm fix on how much energy I'm delivering downrange, what kind of drop I'm getting, and all the rest of it. Uh, it always behooves us to really understand the ballistics of every load that we shoot. All right, good question, Ziba, and good luck with that. And I'll tell you what, if you get this thing, do some of that research and, and get back to us and let us know how it worked for you. But I, I'm thinking I wouldn't hesitate to go moose hunting with that thing. Well, this is Parker from South Dakota. How you doing, Parker? And how is my old home state? Have you got as much snow as we do? <laughs> I hope not, man. It is bad around here. Parker says, hey, Ron. Thanks for taking my question. I'm in the market for a new shotgun, and I wanted your recommendation for the best all-around gas-operated semi-matic 12-gauge. Not trying to put me on the spot, are you, Carl Parker? Oh, gosh. You know what? I can tell you this for sure, Parker. There are so many good semi-autos these days that it's pretty hard to go wrong. I have hunted and had excellent success with Winchesters and Brownings, uh, the Remington, uh, what do they call that? V Max? No, that's the Hornady Bullet. What's that V? I've forgotten the name of the darn thing, but it's a brilliant design on this Remington shotgun. It uses the cartridge itself to control the pressure driving the action. Really pretty, pretty cool. Check out Remington shotguns and you'll figure it out. It's it's not the 1100, which was the old standard from way back in the 60s and 70s. This is a, the V something, and I've forgotten the darn name of the thing. But I was really impressed with the simplicity of that whole system. But of course, the Benelli's and the Berettas have really been sort of owning the market for a lot of years. But boy, in recent years, I have used so many different ones with no issues, including a fairly inexpensive Mossberg. I think it's a 930 series. And Mossberg for a long time has been advertising that they are mill spec. You know, they, they build their shotguns to um, be acceptable to the military. So they're really rugged and well-built. And I borrowed one a couple of years ago hunting up in Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan Goose Company had a heck of a goose shoot up there. Oh my gosh, did they have birds. And we were just running those rifles hard and hot and dirty and that were working beautifully and shot and felt really good too. So I think you want to check them out. Um, get, get a hold of some, if you can borrow them from your buddies or whatever, and try to do some shooting over them to get the feel for them. Because what I've noticed is that some fit and feel so much better for me than others. Um, and I noticed this with the um, A5 from Browning. The newly designed, it looks like the old Auto 5 from back in the day, but it's a completely different system, but a similar look to it. And it's just a nice, slim, trim shotgun that fits me really well. The recoil's really easily managed, and I've shot ducks and geese and pheasants with that and just loved it. It just seems to point naturally for me. Whereas the Winchester, the 3, I think it is, and the 4 now, the X3 and 4s, they work just fine, but they don't shoot all that well for me. My buddies love them. So you're going to have a lot of things to look at there. It's uh, lots of good choices. So I don't think you can go wrong with much of anything. All right. Now we're going to go all the way to Sweden for our next one from Bjorn. Bjorn asks uh, or says, I follow you with great interest on YouTube, but there are a couple of cartridges that I have never heard you mention. The 6XC and the 9.3 by 57. I shoot both of them and I find the XC6, 6, six mm an excellent deer cartridge. And the 9357 works really well on large game. And it's not too different from the 93 by 62 that you have praised in some clips. I would be interesting to have your view. Well, I have not messed around with the XC6. I've had a lot of, heard a lot of good things about it. But I really don't have a need for a target round, which is kind of where it came from. 
I, I guess it works just fine as a hunting ground. And it has all the right shapes and little tweaks to make it extremely accurate for precision shooting. But I've never noticed that the ballistics are significantly better than the 243 Winchester or the 6mm Remington, which I have and have used for a long time. <laughs> so I sort of have the 6 millimeters that I know and love and don't feel a real need to work with this XC. Now, my friend Daryl Holland is pretty high on it, and he's always trying to get me to try one. I might have to do that someday, but honestly, I'm telling you that I don't know enough about the 6XC to really make an intelligent comment on it or an informed one. As for the 93 by 57 to my knowledge, that is the 8 millimeter, the 8 by 57 German Mauser that has been... Um, Oh, well, wait a minute. The 9.3 is the 8 millimeter. I think they've, this, these millimeter designations are not it's precisely accurate. And I think the other name for them, the more precise dimension, would be the 9.3 by 57. So that's the German Mauser. And you've got the J and the JS. And the J is supposed to be an I. This gets really confusing, guys. Over in Germany, when they built this thing way back in the late 19th century, the 8 millimeter, the 8 by 57 or the 9.3 by 57 Mauser, which isn't a Mauser design at all. Told you it was confusing. <laughs> this was the official military cartridge of the German Kaiser, whoever did it. And they called it the J, but it was actually an I for infantry, 8 by 57 infantry cartridge their official military round but the fancy germanic script the i looked like a j to the americans so they called it the j model and over the years pushed that enough that even the germans started calling it the j it had a 0.318 inch diameter bullet on it and in the early oh, 20th century say around 1905 or 4 somewhere in there the German army decided they needed to up this thing to a 0.323 inch diameter bullet for some reason. So then it became a, a new number, the 8 by 57 JS, the S denoting the larger bullet diameter. So it got really confusing. And then after the wars, they prevented the citizenry from owning military rounds. So a lot of folks with 8 by 57s rechambered them to 8 by 62 or something. And yeah, if you want to get confused, dive into the 8 by 57s or the 9.3 by 57 German cartridges. The upshot is the 8 by 57 or this 9.3 by 57 comes pretty close to the same performance as our 30 at 6. Obviously, a little bit wider bullet, a little bit slower velocity, but anything the 30 at 6 can handle, this thing can handle. It's widely accepted. If you increase the length of it to make it the 62 millimeter, that the citizens had to use, the average folks, um, when they got that prohibition against using military rifles and stuff, there you got a little bit more horsepower yet, and it probably exceeds the performance of the 30 out 6 But Bjorn, the reason I don't cover those is because I don't see them over here. I never worked with them. All I've ever done is studied the history of it a little bit, the stuff I've just been spewing. So you can straighten me out if I got it wrong since you have these cartridges and use them. But I will say that a lot of folks over here did bring back the uh, military rifles from the wars and they would sporterize them. Some of them used them as they were chambered, but others couldn't find the ammunition. So they would have them rebarreled to a 30 out six or what else did they do? They would make, um, they would take, no, I can't remember how they did it, but they would take their Mausers and fix them up so they could fire them and use them over here. Some of them stuck with eight by 57s some of our manufacturers produced ammunition for them, but they're obviously not as popular here as the 30 out 6 so we don't see all that many of them. But it is one heck of a round. The German military used it World War I and World War II, so it, uh, it's been put through the ringer, and it's proven itself. Pretty effective cartridge. All right, now we are going to go from Sweden over to Canada and talk to Parker. I've been a fan of lever-action rifles for whitetails, especially due to the thick habitat I usually hunt. I've never been a huge fan of the straight wall cartridges, so I've always felt rather limited to the tried-and-true 3030. Until now, I recently had the opportunity to try a 307 Winchester with great results. My only question is why this dandy cartridge is so forgotten. 
I would appreciate any opinion you may have on this. Thanks. Yeah. The 307 Winchester. Who's heard of this one? Probably not a lot of us. It was created specifically for the Model 94 Winchester lever action rifle, and I think it was the Angle Eject around ooh, 1984, I believe, but it might have been 78. But somewhere back in that foggy, distant era, <laughs> they were trying to improve the performance of the old 3030, and the 307 was essentially the 308 Winchester and rigged up with a uh, rim instead of a, re um, a rimless case so that it would function in the tubular magazines of the lever action rifle. So obviously more horsepower, but you couldn't push it up to the chamber pressures of the 308 Winchester in those lever action rifles. They have always kept the pressures down on those rifles uh, on the supposition that they can't handle as much pressure because of the bolt locking system. On the Model 94, the bolt is forward to push the cartridge into the chamber, and it's held in place at the rear with bars that comes up. So there's a little more flex in that bolt. And I'm not sure exactly how much chamber pressure that thing can handle. I remember P.O. Ackley years ago did a bunch of research cranking the pressures up and up and up, trying to blow up an action, and never really could. And he got his pressures pretty darn high. But to be on the safe side, I think they're keeping their PSIs or their copper units of pressure on these cartridges pretty low, probably down around 50,000 PSI or something, or even less than that. I'm not real sure. At any rate, that was one of the things they had to do with this 307 is reduce the pressures. I think it does have considerably more than the 3030, but not as much as the 308. And of course, to come so there wasn't confusion about it, they couldn't call it the 308, so they went with 307. But it's a 30 caliber. And it just didn't take off because I think it's because most people already knew the 3030 and had a lever action rifle for it or wanted one because dad or grandpa or somebody had one. And they just weren't that familiar with a 307. Doesn't really roll off the tongue as a snazzy cartridge that you think of as deer hunting. You think 4440s and 45s and 3030s and 30 out six. And these were words and phrases and cartridges that had some tradition and they rang a bell with people. And that makes a big, big difference to folks looking. I remember when I went to buy my first deer rifle, I had never heard of a 243, but I sure knew a 3030. I got a 94 30 30, <laughs> even though the 243 shot a lot farther and flatter and would have been a better choice for South Dakota in the open country that I started hunting. At any rate, that is my theory on why the 307 didn't really take off. As you've noticed, yeah, it, it is a heck of a step up from the performance of a 30 30. But in the woods, again, where most of your shots are coming under 150 yards, the 30 30 is a dead on cartridge to that distance. You just hold dead center on your deer. And if you're an accurate shooter with an accurate rifle, you're going to get it. And the bullet has proven itself more than capable of cleanly taking whitetails. So I think most guys just figured, I don't need a faster bullet. I'm not reaching out 250 or 300 yards. That is my theory. If anyone else has more information on it, I'd sure love to hear about it. Write in and let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll tell the results in one of our next podcasts. That'd be cool. All right. This stuff uh, from Pennsylvania. Back to the U.S. of A. here with Jim. Hey, I just saw one of your videos about a chart with ballistics on different calibers. Where can I get a copy? Oh, <laughs> I just saw one of your videos. A copy. Boy, take it off the video, Jim, because I don't know which one you saw. I do a lot of ballistic charts. Tell you what, though, I'll give you better information than that. Remember the old saying, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. I'm going to teach you how to make your own ballistic trajectory charts. Everybody ought to do this. It's pretty simple. You just Google ballistic trajectory chart or calculator, ballistic trajectory calculator, and it will spit up a whole bunch of them. Some of them you have to pay for. Some of them are free and they're excellent. And what you do is you get in there and you read the directions. You got to put a little time in, noodle on it a little bit, and think about it. Pretty soon it'll all start to make sense. And what you do when this little program comes up, it'll ask you to put in the speed of your bullet, your muzzle velocity, the weight of your bullet, and the ballistics coefficient of your bullet. 
and a few more things like that. It'll even give you the option in an advanced stage to put in the temperature and the altitude, your elevation, all the things that affect bullet flight, and it'll give out some really specific data. After you've entered all that stuff and push go, it spits out the numbers. And a lot of them will give you a visual chart showing the curve of the trajectory, and they'll give you the number charts like you saw probably in my video that will say at 100 yards, 200 yards, 300 yards, 400 yards, all these distances out to pretty much as far as you want to put them. It will do the math and tell you your bullet's going to drop this far. It's going to deflect in the right angle wind this far. It's going to retain this much energy. It's going to take this many seconds to get there. Wow. Those are the kinds of details that really clue us in. Ah, now I know what my bullet's doing. Because I have noticed over the years, following a bullet in flight to see what it's doing is really tough. <laughs> I've seen some cool vapor trails coming out of some bullets, especially the hammer, all copper bullets. Those guys look like a jet contrail going through the air. So you can really appreciate the arc and the curve of that trajectory. But if you really want to know what your bullet is doing, you need to run those ballistic calculators. That is the information you want. So Google it. The one that I use a lot is shooterscalculator.com. Uh, I think there's also uh, there's a good one on the Hornady website, a Hornady ballistics calculator that's pretty advanced. And uh, JMB or JBM. I have them on my computer and I just click it and they're, they're there and I don't even look at what they're exactly called. But there are some good ones out there and all of those were free. So look for those and Start to play around with them and you are going to really be educated and surprised and I think delighted to be able to make your own ballistics calculations. Okay, that looks like the last question. Yes, last question of the day. I want to thank all of you, especially our patrons on Patreon. Always enjoy answering your questions and helping you guys out. And I thank everyone for helping me out too. I am more than happy to entertain corrections from you folks, additional information. This to me is sort of a campfire, and we are all sharing what we've learned and, um, and understand about ballistics and guns and hunting, the ethics of it, uh, some cooking, our hunting dogs, anything and everything that has to do with the outdoors and our enjoyment of it. We're covering it here on Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Thanks until next time. Hunt honest and shoot straight.